Ever get to the end of a film, turn to your buddy and say, what the hell did we just watch? In fact, never play this again. Well, wonder no more, gentle moviegoer. We're here to give you the scoop on the real meanings behind these complicated movie endings. The Matrix Revolutions Our hero in the Matrix franchise, Neo, was the only one with enough power to break the Matrix and save humanity. He spent the first two films on an apparent collision course with the near-invincible artificial intelligence program known as Agent Smith. But when their cataclysmic fight in the third installment finally arrived, Neo gave up. So what happened at the end of The Matrix Revolutions? Neo lies on the brink of defeat until he realizes he doesn't need to beat Smith at all. Neo assimilates into the system and Smith is wiped out while The Matrix reboots. Say what? Whoa! The dedicated fans of The Matrix 101 picked apart the scene to figure out what really went down, and here's what they discovered. Neo brokered a sort of truce with the machines, allowing the continued existence of the Matrix Free Zone known as Zion, while healing the corruption in the program personified by Smith. The machines also grant every human the chance to be unplugged from the Matrix and live in the real world or to remain living in their artificial reality. The essay concludes on a hopeful note. This is a world where eradication of the enemy is seen for what it is, a symptom of the problem, not a solution. This is a world where the creator and its creation have the potential to live fruitfully in peace and cooperation. The Fountain Darren Aronofsky's The Fountain features three interlocking stories, each set hundreds of years apart, all about a couple coming to terms with death and culminates in a wild, weird ending. In one timeline, a doctor works to cure the brain tumor of his wife, Izzy. She's written a book in which a Spanish conquistador searches for the Tree of Life for his queen. Meanwhile, in the future, a cosmonaut heads for a distant nebula in a biosphere containing the tree, interacting with Izzy's spirit along the way. It all ends in the cosmonaut's fiery death, the tree's rebirth, and an ending in which Izzy's spirit hands Tom fruit from the tree, which he plants in her grave. Uh, yep. It's all deeply symbolic, and anyone hoping for a literal explanation out of the fountain will be somewhat frustrated. Aronofsky himself told the Washington Post, it's a Rubik's Cube of a story that's ultimately really about coming to grips with our own mortality. He elaborated further in an interview with Ain't It Cool News. It's a film that's a journey, and it's a trip, and it's an experience through the meditation of a lot of these questions. There are ideas in there that I believe, but I think I wanted to leave it open so that anyone can bring their own beliefs to the table, and that it could awaken them, and people can have a conversation. So there you have it, your own interpretation is the right one, apparently. Whoa. Interstellar. Christopher Nolan's sci-fi epic Interstellar is pretty cool, but it's also pretty confusing, particularly in its final act. Astronaut Joseph Cooper, on a desperate mission to find a new home for humanity, plummets into a black hole and drifts beyond the event horizon, finding himself inside a tesseract. There, he can see inside his daughter's bedroom at any point in her life. He communicates with her through gravity and Morse code, guiding her to unlock the equation that helps humanity escape Earth. By the end, Cooper is discovered floating through space by later members of the human race he saved, brought to meet his dying daughter, who's aged at normal speed while he's been on his intergalactic travels and is thus much older than he is. Huh? Boy, when it does, and it feels like you, they could put a blindfold on you and put you in a spaceship and take you to Neptune, and you could hop off on the planet, and they better have the sprocket rolling. The whole film rests on the notion that time is a circle, and future humans have the ability to travel within it. But they only get there by creating this tesseract and helping past people, namely Cooper and his daughter Murph, finish their work. It's a total chicken or the egg style paradox, but just go with it. And while Cooper was off traveling through the wormholes, little Murphy was living on the surface of the circle and kicking this whole journey into gear from a science level until her dad came back to it, like he promised. The Babadook Figuring out the Babadook isn't that difficult, provided you keep up with the sudden change in perspective in the movie's final act. Much of this indie horror hit looks and feels like a supernatural home invasion picture, with the creepy Babadook creature tormenting a single mother and her six-year-old son, but there's more going on beneath the surface. In the film's closing scenes, the Babadook has possessed the mom and she tries to strangle her son, but the boy draws the monster out of her with a tender expression of love. And a knife to the leg, of course. I know you don't love me. The Babadook won't let you. But I love you, Mom. The boy's plan works, and the mom sends the Babadook fleeing to the basement, where mom has stored all mementos of her husband since his death. That's when we realized the creature wasn't supernatural at all. It was her years of repressed grief, which had grown so powerful it threatened to destroy the lives of everything it touched. In a perfect blend of heartwarming and gross, the Babadook's closing moments show mother and son gathering a bowl of worms, which she takes into the basement to feed the vanquished beast. She'll always carry the monster with her because, after all, you can't get rid of the Babadook. It follows. In David Robert Mitchell's film, It Follows, a girl named Jay has a seemingly ordinary hookup, but soon after, she's horrified to realize she's been infected with a sexually transmitted ghost. Who are you gonna call? 
someone else. The ghost takes various human forms, ranging from people in the victim's memories or creepy naked strangers that only someone affected with the disease can see. It constantly walks in the direction of the latest person infected until it grabs them and kills them. Then, the ghost starts walking in the direction of the previous person infected and continues back down the line. Your only option is to pass it off to someone else, hoping the chain keeps going so that the ghost never gets to you. If that sounds ridiculous, well, it kinda is. But it's the setup for a pretty devilish little film. Jay learns she can only escape the evil spirit that's trying to kill her by sleeping with someone else to pass it on. Ultimately, she and her friends try killing it, with generally unpleasant and ambiguous results. After the climactic battle, Jay and her friend Paul have sex, and later Paul's seen driving past a group of prostitutes. In the film's final shot, the duo walk down a street while someone, or something, follows behind. Much of It Follows is open to interpretation, and that's exactly what Mitchell wanted. As he said in multiple interviews, he was originally inspired by a nightmare in which he knew he was being followed, knew he couldn't get away, and knew no one could help him. As for the ambiguity of that last shot, totally intentional. Mitchell wanted viewers to decide whether it was still following Jay and her pals or not. Sleep tight, kids. 2001, A Space Odyssey. There are no shortage of theories about what exactly was going on in Stanley Kubrick's 1968 sci-fi classic, 2001, A Space Odyssey. Rather than dive too far down that rabbit hole, let's instead offer Kubrick's own assessment of the end, in which astronaut Dave Bowman comes into contact with an extraterrestrial monolith and goes through a bizarre succession of experiences. Vast space travel, seeing himself at different ages, and finally being transformed into a floating space fetus. Kubrick explained in an interview, In a timeless state, his life passes from middle age to senescence to death. He is reborn, an enhanced being, a star child, an angel, a superman if you like and returns to Earth prepared for the next leap forward of man's evolutionary destiny. This is what happens on the film's simplest level. But what about the levels that aren't so simple? Kubrick pointed out that 2001 concerns itself with elements of philosophy and metaphysics that have nothing to do with the bare plotline. So whatever his summary tells you about Bowman's fate, you can trust there's more to it, and that any extra meaning is entirely up to you. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Kubrick's explanation continued. The film becomes anything the viewer sees in it. If the film stirs the emotions and penetrates the subconscious of the viewer, if it stimulates, however inchoately, his mythology and religious yearnings and impulses, then it has succeeded. Got all that? Great. Just meet us down at the bar once you've done stimulating your mythological and religious yearnings and impulses, or whatever. No! Thanks for watching. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch more videos like the one you just saw, and leave us a comment to let us know which endings you think should have been on the list.